Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a complete course for the CCNP N Core, Enterprise Core exam. This course will cover all topics you need to know to pass the N Core exam. In this video, we will look at switch stacking, a technique that combines multiple physical switches together to operate as one. This provides several advantages, which we will examine in this video. Here's what we'll cover. First, I'll introduce switch stacking in general and what advantages it offers. This will be a general overview of why we use switch stacking. After that, we will look at three Cisco technologies used to stack switches. Those are VSS, Stackwise, and Stackwise Virtual. They all have their similarities and differences, and different switch models support different ones. We will cover some technical details about them, but not in too much depth. Let's get started. What is switch stacking and why should we do it? Switch stacking allows us to combine multiple physical switches into one logical switch. That means that, although physically they are two separate switches, they operate in the network as one switch. This provides benefits for link usage, redundancy, ease of management, etc. We'll look at those advantages in more detail over the next few slides. So in the diagram below, there are redundant connections. A failure on one link won't take the network down. If any one of the connections between the switches goes down, there will still be a path to reach the other switches. However, during normal operations, not all links will be used. Why is that? It's our old friend spanning tree protocol, of course. STP will block redundant links to avoid layer two loops. So in the network below, it might look like this, with a switch one and a switch two, blocking their interfaces connected to dSwitch2, resulting in those links not being used. It's good to have redundant links in case there is a problem that causes an active link to go down. But it would be even better if we could use all of the links for increased data throughput. Now, you already know of a technology that can be used to combine multiple links together to create one virtual link. That is EtherChannel. It can combine multiple physical links into a single logical link. This means protocols like spanning tree will view the interfaces as a single interface. This can help avoid interfaces being disabled by STP. Both interfaces can be active and forwarding traffic at the same time, with traffic load balanced over them. But there's a problem in this diagram. An ether channel must be between two devices. In the diagram below, a switch one can't form an ether channel to dSwitch one and dSwitch two, and neither can a switch two. That's because dSwitch 1 and 2 are separate switches, and an ether channel must be between two devices, not three or more. Note that Cisco Nexus switches can use a technology called VPC, virtual port channel, to create a port channel across separate switches, but Nexus switches are not relevant to CCNP Enterprise. Nexus switches are part of the CCNP data center track, which is a possible next step after the enterprise. Now, you could double the number of links between devices and configure ether channels as in the diagram below. This will increase the bandwidth between devices compared to the previous setup, but still, half of the ether channels will be disabled by STP. So, A switch 1 and 2 will block their ether channels to D switch 2, disabling those links. Fortunately, there is a solution that allows all links to be active at once. The solution is Multi-chassis ether channel, MEC. Note that the term chassis just means device, not necessarily a big chassis router or switch. So it's an ether channel connected to multiple other devices, not just one. Another term for this is multi-chassis link aggregation group, MLAG or MCLAG. By combining multiple physical switches into a single logical switch, switch stacking enables us to use multi-chassis ether channel. So let's see how that works. Just to clean up the diagram, I removed the extra links between the switches, except for the ether channel between dSwitch1 and dSwitch2, because we are going to make them into a switch stack. When stacking switches together, you definitely want at least two connections between them, or else that connection becomes a single point of failure. So using switch stacking, dSwitch1 and dSwitch2 can be combined into a single logical switch two separate devices 
behaving as a single switch. Then, A switch 1 and 2 can form ether channels to the D switch stack, even though their interfaces are connected to separate physical switches. Each access switch has one physical link to each of the distribution switches. So these are multi chassis ether channels. Now, STP is still used as a failsafe, but there are no loops, so all links can remain enabled. By failsafe, I mean STP is used just in case an error occurs and, for example, one of the ether channels doesn't form. To avoid loops in that case, STP is still used, but under normal circumstances, all interfaces should be up and forwarding. So, now it's like there is just one distribution switch. But what about the access switches? Currently, they are separate switches. A switch 1 and A switch 2 can also be stacked to operate as a single switch, like this. Using one of the stacking technologies we'll look at soon, A switch 1 and A switch 2 can be stacked like the distribution switches. Note that the stacking technology used for access switches is typically different than that used for distribution switches. We'll see those soon. All interfaces are already forwarding, so stacking these access switches doesn't actually improve the throughput between the switches. But there is another benefit that we get from stacking. It simplifies the management of the switches, because all switches in a stack are managed as one. The configuration file is synced to each switch in the stack. When you use SSH, for example, to connect to the stack, you are communicating with the management plane of the active switch in the stack, and configurations made on it are synced to the other switches. We'll get into more details about active and standby soon. So this is our network now. Before we had four switches, but now it's like we only have two. There's one ether channel with four links connecting the A switch stack to the D switch stack. For each of these stacks, the management and control planes are both centralized, controlled by the active switch in each stack. However, the data plane is distributed. Each switch in the stack keeps its own copy of the tables it needs to forward traffic. For example, the Ceph tables for layer 3 forwarding. Let me illustrate that with a slightly larger diagram. Here we have a diagram of a network without stacking the switches. What happens if we stack these switches together? This is what it looks like. The core switches, as well as the switches in each distribution block and access block, can be stacked. What benefits do we get from this? First, all links can be active. STP is running in this network, but it doesn't disable any links because there are no loops. And the second advantage is that management is simplified. The number of switches we have to manage is reduced. On the left, there are 14 switches but on the right, there are only five. So the number of devices we have to manage is just over a third of what it was before stacking the switches. Of course, there are still 14 separate physical switches, but only five logical switches for us to monitor, connect to, make configuration changes, etc. Trust me, if you work as a network engineer, you'll be thankful for switch stacks. One thing to point out about my diagram is that in the with stacking diagram, there are only four links between each access stack and its distribution stack, even though on the left there are eight links between each access and distribution block. When you have large stacks like this with four switches, you don't necessarily need all eight connections to the distribution layer. How many connections you need will depend on exactly how much bandwidth you need. Just wanted to mention that in case you were wondering why the number of links is different. Before we look at the three switch stacking technologies I want to cover, one more important point, interface numbering. Because all switches in a stack share the same configuration, we have to be able to identify which interfaces are on which switch. Let's see how that works. Cisco switch interface numbers typically follow this convention, slot slash interface. Slot refers to, of course, the slot number. That could mean the slot number in a chassis switch which slot is the line card inserted into. Or it could refer to an interface module. I'll show an example of an interface module in a minute. And then interface is that interface number on that particular card or module. For example, Gigabit Ethernet 01 is a common interface name. Slot number 0, interface number 1. 
When switches are stacked, the following numbering convention is used. Switch slot interface. Switch refers to the switch's number within the stack. All switches are assigned a number. Let's see an example to make it easier to understand. These are two Catalyst 9300 switches. Let's say they are connected together to form a stack. The stack ports are located on the back of these switches, by the way. Note that I've labeled the top switch as switch 1 of the stack, and the bottom one as switch 2. So this interface, for example, is Gigabit Ethernet 101. It's switch number 1 in the stack, the slot number is 0, and it's the first interface on this slot. The one below it is G102. And this one at the end of slot 0 is G1024. Note that slot number 0 is used for these 24 fixed interfaces. The 8 interfaces on the right, however, are part of an interface module. This is a part of the switch that is purchased separately and inserted into it. And there are various different modules that can be used, depending on what type of interfaces you need. This module has 8 10 gig interfaces. And this interface, for example, is 10 gigabit Ethernet 115. Note that you would require something like this SFP Plus module to use this interface. Note that SFP Plus refers to SFPs that support 10 gig speeds. Anyway, now let's look at a couple interfaces on the switch below. This one, for example, is gigabit Ethernet 201. Switch 2, slot 0, interface 1. And this one, G203. And on the right side of this switch, there is an interface module with only two interfaces. This one is 40 gigabit Ethernet 212. Switch 2, slot 1, interface 2. These interfaces would require something like this QSFP+, which means Quad SFP+, and supports 40 gig speeds. And note that some switches will use the switch slot interface numbering system, even when not stacked. And in that case, the switch number is 1. These Catalyst 9300s are like that, actually. When not stacked, their interfaces will be G101, G102, G103, etc. So that's how interface numbering works in switch stacks. And hopefully this helps you understand Cisco interface naming in general. However, note that the interface numbering scheme can vary depending on the model of switch. So if you're configuring a new switch, always check the Cisco documentation for that switch model to learn the appropriate interface names. Or just log into the device if you can and use show IP interface brief to check the names. Now let's look at those three different stacking technologies used by Cisco switches. First up, VSS, Virtual Switching System. VSS allows two separate physical switches to form a single virtual switch. Keep in mind that VSS can only stack two switches, not more. It's supported on Catalyst 4500, 6500, and 6800 switches. There might have been others in the past, but these are the main ones. The photo here shows various 6500 series switches. However, these models are all end of sale, which means that Cisco no longer sells them. And VSS is very similar to Stackwise Virtual, which is used on newer switches, and we will cover that later. You could say that VSS has been replaced by Stackwise Virtual. The two switches in the VSS stack are connected via the VSL, Virtual Switch Link, an ether channel between the two devices. It uses 10 gig interfaces, although 40 gig is possible too. Note that a single link for the VSL is possible, but for redundancy, it should be an ether channel of at least two, up to eight, links. If you use only one link, that's a single point of failure, which is never a good thing. Usually, you use interfaces on the supervisor cards to make the VSL, but any 10 gig interfaces work, for example, interfaces on the line cards. Note that the switches in the 4500, 6500, and 6800 series are mostly chassis switches, although there are a few models that aren't. The VSL can connect switches that are kilometers apart using fiber optic cabling. So switches in a VSS stack don't have to be near each other, 
although in most cases they will be in the same general area, such as the same building. The VSL passes two kinds of traffic. The first is VSS control traffic, traffic used to establish and maintain the VSS. But it can also be used to pass regular data traffic. If a message received on one member must be sent out of an interface on the other member, it will be sent over the VSL. Note that I've changed the photo here to show 4500 series switches. Notice they are all modular chassis switches. So before the VSS is activated, the VSL linking the switches must be up and running. So let's see how that's done. First, when a switch boots, the configuration file is parsed for VSL configurations, which should be present if the switch is going to be part of a VSS stack. The VSL links are then enabled. This doesn't mean the VSL itself is initialized yet, just that the interfaces that will be part of the VSL have come online. VSLP, Virtual Switch Link Protocol, is used to establish and maintain the VSL and VSS. And VSLP has two component protocols, LMP and RRP. Let's see what they do. LMP, Link Management Protocol, performs the following functions. First, it verifies link integrity by establishing bidirectional traffic forwarding. To put it simply, it checks if each link in the VSL can send traffic both ways, from switch 1 to switch 2, and from switch 2 to switch 1. Unidirectional links are rejected and can't be part of the VSL. LMP also exchanges switch IDs. Before setting up the VSS, you should configure one switch's ID as one, and the other as two. If both switches identify as switch one of the stack, the VSS will fail. It also exchanges other required information, but there's no need for more detail here. Then RRP, Role Resolution Protocol, performs the following functions. First, it determines if the hardware and software versions of the switches are compatible. And it also determines the active switch and standby switch. The active role is fairly straightforward, but the role of the standby switch depends on the next part of the process. Depending on the compatibility checks, the stack will come up in one of two modes. One option is RPR, Route Processor Redundancy Mode. In this case, the standby switch cannot forward traffic, but is available as a backup if the active fails. The other option is NSF slash SSO mode which means non-stop forwarding slash stateful switchover. NSF and SSO will be covered in another video, but just know that in this context, it means the standby switch is fully initialized and can forward traffic. To clarify those two modes, in RPR mode, the management, control, and data planes of the standby switch are all on standby, while the active switch does all the work. The standby switch doesn't forward traffic. Whereas in NSF SSO mode, the data plane of the standby switch is active and it can forward traffic. Okay, that's all we'll cover about VSS. Like I said before, you could say VSS has been replaced by Stackwise Virtual. However, I still think it's worth knowing about, and there's a chance it could come up in the Encore exam. If you want more information about VSS, try a Google search for Cisco 6500 VSS white paper. That will link you to a Cisco document explaining VSS, although the information in this video should be enough for Encore. Now let's move on to Stackwise. It allows up to eight, or nine depending on the model, separate physical switches to be stacked and operate as a single logical switch. In this photo here, I'm showing a stack of four Catalyst 9200 series switches. Stackwise is supported on Catalyst 3750 and 3850 series, and Catalyst 9200 and 9300 series switches. That's not necessarily a complete list, those are just some examples. Note that the 3750 and 3850 series are old. 3750 is end of support, meaning Cisco no longer sells or offers technical support for them, and the 3850 series is end of sale 
meaning they are no longer sold, but customers can still get technical support for them. The 9200 and 9300 series are current, so we'll focus on them in this video. There may be some differences between stackwise on these newer switches and on the older ones, but for the most part it's the same. So, switches that support stackwise have special stack ports on the rear of the chassis. As I mentioned before, chassis here doesn't mean a large modular chassis switch. Chassis is just referring to the physical switch. The 9200 and 9300 series are not the big modular chassis switches. Proprietary stack cables are used to connect the stack ports of each switch together. This is different than VSS, which uses regular Ethernet network cables. Here's a rear photo of that 9200 stack. Notice the stack cables connected to the stack ports. Keep in mind that the stack-wise stack cables do not support long distances. Cisco offers them in half meter, one meter, and three meter lengths. So switches in a stack-wise stack will typically be in the same rack, or perhaps neighboring racks. The switches in the stack form a ring topology. So switch one connects to switch two, two to three, three to four, and four back to one in a ring. This provides redundancy because there are always two paths to reach another switch in the stack. For example, for switch one to reach switch two, it can send traffic directly to switch two or to switch two via switch four and switch three. However, if one of the stack connections fails, the ring is cut off and will operate at half speed until the connection is restored. Note that these stack connections can support quite high speeds, up to one terabit per second of speed in some models. This stack connection serves the same purpose as in VSS. It passes both control traffic and data traffic if necessary. Here's a summary of StackWise from Cisco. A switch stack can have up to eight stacking capable switches connected through their StackWise ports. The stack members work together as a unified system. Layer two and layer three protocols present the entire switch stack as a single entity to the network. Note that it mentions up to eight switches. That's true for 92 and 9300 series switches. The older 3750 and 3850 switches support up to nine. Now let's see a few details about how the stack comes up. First, notice I've changed the photos from 9200 to 9300 series switches. Here are the stack cables, but notice there are also some cables on the right. These are stack power cables. They can be used to aggregate and manage available power for the stack. If one switch needs more power, for example if it has lots of PoE devices connected, it can take extra power from other switches in the stack. We won't get into any details about stack power. I'm just mentioning it since you can see the cables here. So when all switches in the stack are powered on, SDP, Stack Discovery Protocol, uses broadcast messages via the stack connections to discover the stack topology. And after all switches in the stack have been discovered, switch numbers are determined. All switches must have a unique number from one to eight, or one to nine in models that support nine switch stacks. These numbers are automatically determined, but can be manually changed if you want. For example, for simple management, you might want to make sure the top switch is switch one, then the one below it is switch two, etc. Then, after discovery, an active switch is elected. Switches that boot up within a two minute election window participate. Switches that join the stack after this window will not participate. The highest priority and then lowest MAC address are used to determine the active switch in that order. Highest priority and then lowest MAC address if there is a tie. You can configure the priority, of course, but we won't look at configurations in this video. Then, two minutes after the active election, a standby switch is elected. The election uses the same parameters as above. This is the switch that is ready to take over for the active switch if needed. And finally, other switches are simply called members. They are active in forwarding, 
but not ready to immediately take over for a failed active switch. They don't keep updated information about routing protocol states, for example. And switches added to the stack later will also become members. An election is not triggered when a new switch is added. Okay, that's all we'll cover about stack-wise for now. We'll come back to it later to compare all of these stacking technologies. Now finally, let's look at stack-wise virtual. As mentioned earlier, it is very similar to VSS, so much of this information will be familiar. But there are some slight differences, and I'll give some extra details. Stackwise Virtual allows two separate physical switches to form a single virtual switch, no more than two switches. It can be considered a replacement for VSS. It's supported on Catalyst 9400, 9500, and 9600 series switches. In the photo below, I show some 9400 series switches, by the way. The switches in the stack are connected via the SVL, Stackwise Virtual Link. This has the same purpose, and a similar name, as the VSS VSL, Virtual Switch Link. Be careful not to mix the names up. Interfaces of a variety of speeds can be used for the SVL. 10 gig, 25 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, it depends on the switch model. And the SVL can connect member switches kilometers apart, using fiber optic cabling. This is the same as VSS but different than stack-wise, which only supports short distances. The SVL passes two kinds of traffic, control traffic and data traffic. This is the same as in VSS as well as stack-wise. Note that frames sent across the SVL are encapsulated with a 64-byte stack-wise virtual header, SVH, in the diagram below. This encapsulation is done by the ASIC of the egress interface, and then it is de-encapsulated by the ASIC of the ingress interface. To finish up the topic of stackwise virtual, let's see how the SVL and the stack as a whole start up. This will be similar to VSS. When a switch boots, the configuration is parsed for SVL configurations, and then the SVL interfaces are enabled. Then two protocols are used for initialization. LMP and SDP. LMP, like in VSS, stands for Link Management Protocol. It performs functions like verifying link integrity by establishing bidirectional traffic forwarding. Same thing as in VSS. It also sends periodic hello messages to maintain the SVL and exchanges other information that we don't need to get into here. Then SDP, Stackwise Discovery Protocol, performs the following functions. It determines hardware and software compatibility, and also determines the active and standby switch. So basically it's the same as RRP, Role Resolution Protocol in VSS. It's worth noting that Stackwise also uses a protocol called SDP, but in that case it's Stack Discovery Protocol, not Stackwise Discovery Protocol. The names are very similar, but their functions are different. So it seems they are not aspects of the same protocol, but different protocols entirely. Final point. In stackwise virtual, from a management and control perspective, only one switch is active, but both can forward traffic, as shown in this diagram. Okay, that's all we'll cover about stackwise virtual for now. Here's a simple chart comparing some aspects of these stacking technologies. Because these three technologies have many similarities, I recommend taking notes to remember what we covered in this video and make sure you can differentiate between them. Now before wrapping up, let me show one example of how stacking can be used. Here we have a company with three offices in three buildings, building one on the left and then buildings two and three. The distribution switches of each office are on floors two and three, connected with an ether channel and there are a few access switches on each floor too for PCs, phones, wireless access points, printers, servers, etc. The access switches are connected to the distribution switches, like this. Each access switch connecting to each distribution switch in the same building. 
Those distribution switches will then connect to core switches. But to keep the diagram slightly cleaner, I'm leaving out the core switches for now. So in this diagram, we have 27 switches. And if we include two core switches, that would bring the count to 29. Now let's see how we could use switch stacking to improve this network, both by increasing link usage and by simplifying management. So here's how the network would look with stacking, including the core switches this time. I haven't specified where the core switches are exactly, but they might be in a totally separate location or in one of these three buildings. Now, which stacking technologies am I using in this example? Access switches on the same floor are stacked using Stackwise. Let's say they're all in a rack in a server closet on each floor. Then, distribution switches in the same building are stacked using Stackwise Virtual. They are placed on different floors for improved physical safety. For example, if there is a fire on one floor and the sprinklers go off, it's good to have each switch in a separate floor. The distance is no problem, because the Stackwise Virtual Link can use fiber cabling. Then, the core switches also use Stackwise Virtual. Each of the core switches might be placed in a different building, or maybe the same building on different floors. Anyway, that's just an example of how to use these stacking technologies. Notice I didn't use VSS in this design. That's because VSS has been replaced by Stackwise Virtual on newer Switch models. Here's what we covered in this video. I first introduced Switch stacking and its advantages, such as improved link usage and simplification of management. Then we looked at three Cisco stacking technologies, VSS, Stackwise, and Stackwise Virtual. Finally, at the end, I gave an example design of how to use these stacking technologies in a real network. If you work as a network engineer, you'll definitely get hands-on with switch stacking. It's a very common technology, not just for Cisco, but for all network hardware vendors. Okay, let's go to the quiz to test your understanding. Here's quiz question one. Which of the following are advantages of switch stacking? Select two. Pause the video now to think about the answers. Okay, the answers are B and C. MEC stands for multi-chassis ether channel, which allows a device to create an ether channel connecting to multiple other switches. Switch stacking enables this by allowing multiple switches to operate as one. And stacking also simplifies management because multiple switches can be managed as one. A is incorrect because, when switches are stacked, the control plane isn't distributed, but centralized on the active switch. And when switches are stacked, forwarding isn't centralized, but distributed. Each switch in the stack can perform its own forwarding. Okay, let's go to question two. Which of the following technologies can stack switches that are geographically distant from each other? Select two. Pause the video now to select the answers. Okay, the answers are A, VSS, and B, Stackwise Virtual. Both of them can stack switches using fiber optic cables, which support long distances. Stackwise, on the other hand, uses proprietary stack cables, which are a maximum of 3 meters in length. Okay, let's go to question 3. Which of the following switch series support VSS? Select two. Pause the video now to select the answers. Okay, the answers are B, 4500, and D, 6500. In addition to these two, I also mentioned the Catalyst 6800 series. It also supports VSS. Switches in the Catalyst 9K series such as 9400 and 9600, do not support VSS. It has been replaced by Stackwise Virtual. Okay, let's go to question four. Which of the following protocols verifies link integrity and rejects unidirectional links? Pause the video now to select the answer. Okay, the answer is A, LMP. 
Link management protocol is used by VSS to bring up and maintain the VSL, virtual switch link. It's also used by Stackwise Virtual for the SVL, Stackwise Virtual Link. One of its roles is to verify link integrity and reject unidirectional links. Okay, let's go to question five. A Stackwise switch stack has four switches. The active switch has a priority of five, and the standby switch has a priority of three. What happens if you add a new switch to the stack with a priority of 15? Pause the video now to select the best answer. Okay, the answer is A. The new switch will become a member. Once the switch stack has been established and the active and standby switches have been selected, those roles will not change when a new switch is added. A new election is not triggered. Okay, that's all for the quiz and this video. I hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching. Before finishing this video, let me thank my JCNP level channel members. To become a member, please click the join button under the video. Thanks to Yonatan Makara, Velva Jacob, George Streeter, Funny Dart, Nasir Chowdhury, Devin Suku, Gustavo Biar, Gerard Baker, Marcel Lord, Pavel M, Mr. Erlison, Dragos Hirnea, Zakib Shah, Mayor Salman, Mazen Anderson, Vitaus194, Gina Lindley, Mark Jackson, Bold1C1U, Michael Carroll, Gerald Guillaume, Gabriel Braga, Hector Hernandez, Ali Polet, Mara Tuba, Roji Kuriakos, Arpad Konives, Five Feet, Owad, Daniel Brown, Tricky Mickey123456, Scott Thompson, Jose Alvarez, Kevin Hayes, Hussein Yavus, Samuel Tavares, Mustafa Ersoy, Dear Diso, Nasser Zahar, Alexandru Badic, Brian Grant, Georgi Gemajev, Ahmed Ismail, Dibia Swain, Arlen Plagaria, Adelson Pereira, Abdo Zizo, Farad69, and Lucien Stoichetoyu. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. Thanks to you and my other supporters, I am able to make these videos and release them for free on YouTube, so I really appreciate the support. Another great way to support the channel is to like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this video with others. So if this video was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you did any of those. Thanks for watching.